great to be here uh, today to talk to you and uh, to uh, talk to you a little bit about um, Drunk Hulk, but more importantly, to talk to you about writing and how I write and how my writing influences my life. Um, <clears throat> to start with, I've been writing since I was a little kid. Uh, I used to write short stories about monsters and share them with my friends and share them with my teachers. Writing stories has been part of my identity. It's been part of who I am for as long as I can remember. When I was nine years old, I wrote my first book, The Mystery of the Skull with the Crown. It's very powerful, and um, hopefully it will never see the light of day. But um, it was my first book, and I was certainly very, very proud of it. So, but writing's important. Books are important. I grew up reading books. I grew up hearing the stories my parents would share with me. And writing is so important, and I wanted to be this American writer, the serious, romantic American writer, like F. Scott Fitzgerald or Ernest Hemingway, and I wanted to write the perfect American novel. And so I grew up with that in my head, and, and this is what I aspired for. I took it very, very seriously. And so, um, and another thing about storytelling, though, I want to say that's also important is, is that, and what Ralph was talking about earlier, is that stories and storytelling, it's, we are stories. We're a collection of stories. I talked about this earlier, um, that storytelling um, is what creates our identity. And sharing these stories are what's important. And we are who we are because of storytelling. And so we have these collection of stories that we come together. We are anthologies. Some days we're drama, some days we're romance, some days we're horror stories. But the point is, is that we are a collection of stories. And the great thing about literature and the great thing about storytelling is that it tells us that we need to connect. And through stories is how we connect. <clears throat> and so. Um, by connecting, we can find common ground, and the great literature, American literature, whatever, all great literature, the fundamental message is really simple. Everything will work out. I'm extremely optimistic, and it's, and it's something I'm really, really um, uh, proud of in terms of our, our great stories. But to understand the storytelling and understand what writing is, and, and particularly my writing, is, is that I use writing to reconcile my past and the present and, of course, the inevitable and uncertain future. And starting with the past, is past to me is exposition. When I'm sitting down to write a story, I have to kind of create the world. And I have to start from scratch. And so I create a scene. So this is going to be outside. The grass is green. But if it's a beautiful, cloud, if it's a beautiful sunny day or if it's cloudy outside, or maybe it's nighttime, all right? But the point is, is that we create these scenes and that you read the book or the story and you're kind of getting your footing. If it's a science fiction book, is this our world or is it just like our world? Is the gravity the same or um, is it completely different? We build the universe, we build these worlds and we create these scenes. This is using the past in our story. Because the reality is that when we start writing, it's all fuzzy. We don't know what's going on, all right? And we're still figuring it out, just like you're figuring out the story when you read it. And so we get to the present, and the present is the best part. When writers talk about writing being magical, this is usually what they're talking about when they're, it, we're right in the now, right in the present. And how that works is, essentially, that the story eventually takes shape. And it's like a landscape. And it has a shape to it. And we're writing, we're writing. And eventually, we are at the edge of this landscape. When you're reading a book, you don't know what's going to happen next. And when the writer is doing the job well, we don't know what's going to happen next. And the story is unfolding in front of us, just like it unfolds for you, the reader. And that's when it's magical. And this could be last a long time, but usually lasts very, very uh, small amount of time. And so the now is the best part of writing, when I don't even know what's going to happen next. 
And so, of course, from the present, we get to the future. Now, the future, when you're a reader, what's great about reading is that you're aware that the story is finite. If you're reading on an e-reader or online or something, the scroll bar tells you how long the story is going to be. If you're reading a book, the book, the size of the book, you know how many pages are left. You're aware that the story is finite. But unfortunately for the writer, that page is blank. It's infinite. It can go on forever. The possibilities are endless. And so we write, and we get our story, and we shape it, and we put it together. But my belief in a story is pretty simple. I believe is that the character needs to get home. That's how I view it. And so through this storytelling, through this story, I carve out a path. And I dig through, and I carve a path out. Sometimes I'm expecting to go right, but instead I go left. And I carve out this path, and I create a river. Just like Huckleberry Finn taking the river down back home, I am taking my character home, bringing him where he or she needs to be. Not a physical place, a home, but where that person needs to be. And that is what I do in terms of writing. And so I want to apply my writing in real life, how I use this in real life and how I see it. And of course, I'll start with the past. So I'll start with this story. When I was a kid, my older brother and I were playing cowboys and Indians. And because my brother was older, he was the cowboy, and I was the Indian. And on this day, my brother was inspired to get the rope from the garage and to tie me to the tree really tight. And I could, the rope is under my arms, and I'm just hanging there against the tree. And my brother, he's in his cowboy hat, and he's running around the tree with his cap gun, and he's shooting at me. Boom, boom, boom. And he's running around, he's dancing and shooting at me, and I'm just sitting there doing my thing. My mom looks out the window, and she sees my brother with his guns, and his loud guns, and the gunpowder going off of these old caps. And my mom runs outside, because she was so protective of me, and she yelled at my brother, and she grabs my brother, and she drags him into the house. And the problem is, is that she kind of forgot about me. So I was at the tree, hanging out. Beautiful day. Just kind of stood there. That's all I could do. And eventually, I just kind of fell asleep. Took a nap. Now, when I tell this story to my mom, I like to say that I was asleep for about 10 hours, 12 hours. But probably, you know of an hour. And I was woken up by my father, who had come home from work. And my father said, what are you doing? <laughs> Playing cowboys and Indians. <laughs> my father saw the guns on the ground and, and he see my mom at the window, and she kind of figured out what was happening. And so my father untied me, and he bent down, and he hugged me, and he brought me in, brought me home. And what I remember about that moment at the tree standing there is that I was never afraid. I just knew that eventually somebody was going to come and somebody was going to take me home. And I try to remember that. I try to remember it if I move forward in life. We'll jump to a little closer to the present, to 2003, when I was working in America at a corporation, and a corporation I wasn't really happy with. And I was working and, uh, in a cubicle, and in a weird way, I felt like I was tied to the tree still, that I needed to get somewhere. And through online, I found there was a job opening in Poland uh, to teach. And so I applied, and for whatever reason, they applied right back, and they gave me the job. Send me an email. Come over. And so I got rid of everything I owned. No kidding. Got rid of everything I owned, and I packed up my bag. Everything fit in a one suitcase. And I wasn't scared. I was just too excited to be scared. And, but I wasn't, that's not true. I was scared at one moment when I landed in Poland and I had my suitcase, and I'm standing in control with my passport. And I realized that all I have is an email that tells me that I have a job. I don't, that's all I have. 
I don't know if the job is real. I don't know if the school is real. I don't know anything. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm a little worried, and all I have is the email, and I thought, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. But it worked out. It worked out really, really well. I ended up in Wrocław, and I've been there ever since, and I absolutely love it. Beautiful city, a lot of history, lots of great stories, and for a writer, it's a great place to be. And it's also in Wrocław, if I move forward to 2009, when I'm sitting in a coffee shop writing, and I just finished this particularly dark and depressing story, and I wanted to do something fun. And I just had this image in my head of the Incredible Hulk, and I thought, you know, wouldn't it be funny if the Hulk was drunk? And so I went on Twitter, and I put in Drunk Hulk, and it was available. And so I signed up, and I became the Incredible Hulk that day. Now, the Incredible Hulk um, on this day, my original plan was just to have fun, just tweet. And with, with the Hulk, it's, it's pretty easy. All you have to do is use... Uh, you know, caps, all caps, and broken English, and, you know, and just make a joke. And so I created this, and it became the most popular thing I've ever done. And right now, currently, I have over 140,000 people following it, and it continues to grow. And the Hulk here is a drunk version of what you know the Hulk to be, and he talks about pop culture and things that happen in life. And... Sometimes my own opinion gets through, but most of the time I try to keep it as the Hulk. And so I imagine the Hulk not as a superhero, but as the drunk guy at the end of the bar watching television who says very stupid things, but every once in a while says something really smart. And so that's my view of the Hulk, sitting there at the bar lying down. And so with the Hulk and with Drunk Hulk, I've learned over the years with this character and through this writing not to take it seriously. Because I'm a serious writer and I sit there and I try to get the perfect sentence and create the perfect paragraph and hopefully create the perfect story and I edit myself to death and I take it so seriously. And with Drunk Hulk, I've learned that all I had to do was hit the caps lock and then get paper like this and write in broken English. And I spent years trying to get noticed and trying to get seen as a writer. And the first time I write like this, all of a sudden, everybody notices. <laughs> everybody. I'm writing the worst possible English, all caps, which annoys everybody. Kurt Vonnegut in Breakfast of Champions said that life can be dangerous and it can hurt, but it doesn't mean it's serious. And I read that a long time ago, and I keep forgetting that. It's not serious. And I've learned through Drunk Hulk not to take life seriously. Which brings me, of course, to my future, the uncertainty of it. My future, my life. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm going to, which direction I'm going to go. And I don't know, you know, how I'm going to, do, to get there, wherever I'm going. I also know that I don't know how much time I have. The book, we know when it's going to finish, but with life, we don't know, unfortunately. And I don't know anything about except now. I know right now I'm standing here at TEDx in front of an amazing audience, and I'm talking to you today, and that's all I know. I can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. I can't tell you what's going to happen next week. I can't tell you any of these things. But what I can tell you is that no matter what happens, I'm going to get home. Someone's going to take me there. Thank you very much.